Hello, and welcome to Ideas Having Sex with Chris Kaufman. I'm Chris Kaufman, and each show I bring to you an interesting and provocative scholar to discuss topics in social science, philosophy, history, politics, and more. If you enjoy what I do, please take a minute to subscribe to the show and to give us a rating and review wherever you listen. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Ideas Having Sex. My guest today is philosopher Mike Humer. Mike's a returning guest to the show and the author of several books, including The Amazing Problem of Political Authority. The book we're discussing today, co-authored with Brian Francis, is called Can We Know Anything? A Debate. Mike, it's great to have you back. Thanks. It's great to be here. So this is a debate book. First of all, what's the topic of the debate and who's taking what side? It's about philosophical skepticism. So Brian is tasked with defending skepticism, and I'm tasked with defending knowledge. The title of the book makes it sound like it's about global skepticism, like can we know anything, but it's not really about that. So we talk about external world skepticism, like can you know the stuff outside your mind? And then we talk about what he calls controversy skepticism, which is the view that you, you don't know things about controversial issues. So if you have if you have opinions about, you know, like abortion, whether abortion is wrong or not, you don't, in fact, know the answer to that. Both of you guys are philosophers, so you spend a decent amount of time talking about what you mean by different terms. So what kind of issues can you get out of the way with semantic issues like what do we mean by knowledge? You distinguish between, I think, like certainty skepticism and, and justification skepticism. I think people have different things in mind when they use these words. So like, what do you end up really disagreeing about? Among undergraduates, it's common to be a certainty skeptic, you know, like that's the most popular kind, which is probably because it's easier to be a certainty skeptic. And it's also a lot less interesting and uh, doesn't matter. All right. So the certainty skeptics are the people who say that we don't know things because we're not 100% absolutely certain, right? So, okay. So, you know, contingent claims about the external world are never absolutely certain. And, you know, they're really strong arguments for that. That also doesn't matter. So, you know, if it turns out that there's some tiny chance that any of your external world beliefs is false, so what? And that doesn't mean that you should change your beliefs. It doesn't mean that you should change anything about your behavior or anything like that, right? So the more interesting kind of skepticism is justification skepticism, right? Which is about whether your beliefs are even justified. What Brian argues is if you're going to count as knowing something about the external world, you should have something to rule out alternative scenarios, like that your brain in a vat, right? Like the brain in a vat in your background there, right? Yes. <laughs> there, should, <laughs> there should be something to rule that out, but he doesn't want to interpret rule out to mean with absolute certainty. I take it to mean something like, well, you just need to have like a good enough reason to reject the alternative scenarios. I guess that's what we disagree about. Although he doesn't seem to be very convinced of skepticism either. Like, you know, the tone that I got from it is that he thought skepticism isn't a ridiculous position. <laughs> There's like an interesting argument for it, right? But that it wasn't completely convinced of it. It didn't seem like. Yeah, it seems like a lot of people who talk about it, even people who are more sympathetic to it, I don't know, it's not always obvious that they really believe it. So what's the point of skeptical arguments or entertaining serious skeptical arguments? Is it really reasonable? I mean, Brian acknowledges that many people think these, you know, students he talks to think these arguments and scenarios are crazy, but nevertheless, many smart people find them important to talk about. So, you know, wh why even go into brain and vat hypotheses and things like that? Well, my take on why it's interesting to talk about skepticism is that it reveals something about our concept of knowledge. So the fact that it's possible to construct an argument that you don't know almost any of the things that you think you know and that that argument, like its premises seem plausible to most people at first glance, and they can't say what's wrong with it, that shows that there's something going wrong with our understanding of knowledge. It shows that we're confused about the nature of knowledge, that, you know, like we have an inconsistent conception because like we think that we know that we have two hands or something like that. But we also think that in order to know something, you have to be able to rule out the alternatives that are incompatible with it, right? And, you know, we also think that you can't rule out a scenario by appealing to things that would be true if that scenario were true, right? Because, you know, this is this is one of the one of the premises, this is like part of why there's a problem. Like, you can't rule out that you're a brain in a vat because all of the evidence that you have is the way that it would be if you were a brain in a vat. 
And so it doesn't seem like that evidence could be evidence against you know, being a brain event. My view, the reason for bringing this up, like if you're teaching an epistemology class, is not that, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe we don't know anything. The reason is to figure out what's going on. Like, you know, what is the nature of knowledge? Can something be evidence against a hypothesis, even though it would be true if the hypothesis were true? Because if that's the case, that would be really interesting. And so, you know, we need to figure that out. Yeah. So like the issue is, is you're describing it is if you try to provide any evidence against the idea that you're a brain in a vat or that you're in the matrix or that you're hallucinating right now or, you know, there's brain in the vat kind of, I think, is a stand in. Tell me if you think I'm wrong about this, but I think of it as a stand in for there's no end probably of skeptical scenarios you could use. So Brain in a Vat is one, but you could be on a galactic reality show or something like that. People watch Rick and Morty. That's the, you know, Earth is a reality show to some aliens or something like that. And The Matrix is one kind of version of a Brain in the Vat that kind of mixes Brain in the Vat with being in a simulation. A more normal one is you could just be dreaming. And anything you offer as evidence that you're not in those scenarios could just as easily be consistent with being in those scenarios. So it's not evidence to it. So I guess, what are some plausible responses to why that's not a good argument? Yeah. And so, um, you know, like, as you say, there's a few different scenarios, right? There's like the simulation hypothesis. Maybe we're all living in a computer simulation. And there there was the deceiving God hypothesis from Descartes. And then yeah. there's the hypothesis that it's all a dream or something. You know, most of them involve some intelligent being who is trying to deceive you, like intelligent, very powerful being who is trying to make you think that all of the things that you believe are true. So, and they're just like little variations on that. So, okay. What are the responses to this? Like, okay, so there are some responses that I don't like very much, right? So like there's the Dretzky response, which is, you know, in order to count as knowing something, you don't have to rule out every logically possible alternative to it. You only have to rule out the relevant alternatives. And where these are understood as something like alternatives that in objective reality had a chance of being true. So if there were brain in a vat technology and there were people who were periodically going around and grabbing brains and putting them in vats and then <laughs> creating this stimulation, then, then it would have been a genuine possibility that you might have been a brain in a vat. It would have been like a real objective chance of that having happened to you. And then it would be relevant. And then you would have to have evidence against it in order to know anything about the external world. So we better hope that nobody does that, right? Nobody starts invading brains. And you don't think that's a good response? Yeah, uh, I, I don't like this response, even though like I think there's something right about what Dresky says about knowledge, about the way that we use the word no. Like it's plausible that the way we use it, it doesn't require you to rule out every logically possible alternative, right? But it's not that helpful because this is just a semantic response. You wind up arguing about the use of the word no, and the response doesn't tell you why the brain in a vat is an unreasonable scenario. Like it doesn't tell you why that's unlikely to be true, or you know, it doesn't give you any justification for rejecting it. It basically tells you like, so assuming that you're not in fact a brain in a vat, then you get to count as knowing it. <laughs> Right. But does it, it doesn't give you any evidence or any argument that you're not a brain of that, right? Which you would like to have, right? It says that you don't need an argument that you're not a brain of that, right? But there should be one. It does seem relevant to me that the idea that, that we don't have real examples that we're aware of, of brains and vats, and that if we did have such examples, that would raise the possibility that we were a brain in a vat. So the fact that we don't have those examples lowers the probability. Like, this is why the idea that you might be in a coma dreaming or just asleep dreaming is a much more reasonable skeptical hypothesis than the brain in the vat, right? You know, this reminds me of how Descartes carries out the first meditation, right? Where he tries to ground the skeptical scenarios in something that he already believes. So, you know, when he introduces the dream hypothesis, he starts by mentioning how he's often been asleep dreaming and he thought that the things that he was seeing were real. Uh, the people who propose the simulation hypothesis say stuff like this. They try to give evidence from like real evidence, real empirical evidence. Yeah, yeah. If we were living in a simulation, then none of our evidence, like none of what we think we know about computer technology or anything like that would be reliable. It's all fake evidence, right? So there's something weird and self-undermining about this, right? Okay. Okay, but but by the way, like what Dretzky is saying is he's not saying we don't have evidence for the brain in a vat hypothesis. It's an externalist view about knowledge. So he's saying it's the fact that, in fact, there is no brain in a vat technology 
regardless of what you know about it. There's an actual objective fact that there's no brain of vat technology. And that's what makes it so that nobody has to rule out the brain of vat hypothesis in order to know things about the external world. And so it doesn't matter if they have evidence <laughs> that there is or isn't brain of vat technology. One response that, that seems unsatisfying to me, and maybe I just don't understand it, so I was wondering if you could elaborate on it, is it seems like there are philosophers who say that even if you were in a simulation or in a brain in a vat or something like that, it wouldn't be possible for a brain in a vat to think about a brain in a vat and that that rules out the possibility or something like that. One, it seems like, is that an empirical claim? I mean, is that a prediction that if someone were to create brain in vatting technologies and we could see what they're thinking about, that they would never, in fact, think about brains in vats? Like, is that an actual empirical prediction or is or is there some uh, other claim going on there? It's an a priori prediction, so to speak, right? Sure. The people are saying, so, you know, this comes especially from Hillary Putnam uh, in a chapter called Brains in a Vat in Reason, Truth, and History. What he's saying is, no matter what went through the brain's mind, it would not count as a thought about brains. Okay, so, you know, you make the brain in a vat, and it's like a physical duplicate of your brain. And it's, it's in exactly the same state with a, you know, same pattern of neuron firings. Okay, and it has experiences like it's qualia are going to be just like yours. And it's going to have thoughts that are qualitatively like yours, but they will not refer to the same things that your thoughts refer to. So at the time when you're having a thought about a brain in a vat, it's going to be having a thought that feels the same, but it won't be about a brain in a vat. It will, it will not count as being about that. Instead, it will count as being about a virtual brain in a vat or something like that, right? Or, you know, maybe it'll be about a state of the computer, Right. And the reason for that is, well, what a person's thoughts refer to is determined by what normally causes thoughts of that type. So like when you think about the color red, that's tied to your sensation of red. And what actual physical phenomenon you're referring to with like your idea of red depends upon what physical phenomenon caused the sensation of red in you in the past. So it's a certain range of wavelengths of light. Right. But the reason why you're referring to that range of wavelengths of light is the causal connection between those wavelengths and your sensations. Okay, If you buy that, then there could be somebody who is having exactly the same sensation as you, but it could be referring to a different physical phenomenon. That doesn't rule out the idea of like a mature person with a mature brain being kidnapped and invaded. Like if you, right. you know, were 30 years old with experiences referring to real brains and then you were invaded... Uh, yeah, so yeah. it doesn't, it seems like it doesn't rule out a lot of skepticism. It just rules out like a pretty narrow skeptical hypothesis. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. If, yeah. If, if that argument is right, it sounds weird to me, but I, maybe I'm just not following it. It only rules out the hypothesis that you are always a brain in a vat, but if somebody kidnapped you last night and put you in the vat, then you could still be thinking about brain to vats. Uh, however, if that's the hypothesis, you know, then you would be able to use some evidence from your past experience, right? So your general knowledge that we don't have brain of that technology could be used to rule out the scenario that you were just kidnapped last night. What do you think about this line of argument? This has occurred to me with these scenarios. So with a lot of these, let's just take like, here's a scenario from the TV show Rick and Morty, because they use a lot of good sci-fi scenarios. So Rick's special spaceship engine is powered by a microscopic universe that he created full of people. And he tricked them and lied them into using a certain kind of energy technology that he siphons like 20% of the energy off of to power his motor. And they don't know they're living in this world that he created for their purposes. So that's one kind of skeptical scenario. You could be living in a weird hypothetical world created by an evil scientist to power his spaceship engine. In that world, a scientist eventually came to be and did something similar and created another smaller world to power his engines. And that this, this iterates and happens like four times. So one skeptical hypothesis is you could be living in this fake spaceship engine world, or you could be living in one iteration down from that. Or you could be living two or three or four. So from a skeptic's perspective, is there any reason for preferring one of those hypotheses to another? Or is there any reason to prefer the idea that 
you could be in the matrix or you could be in a matrix within a matrix or a matrix within a matrix within a matrix. And if there's any reason for saying that, well, it's less likely that you're like 17,000 matrixes down, it seems like whatever reasons you're giving for preferring one of those explanations to another is the same kind of reasoning you'd be preferring a regular world hypothesis to a matrix hypothesis or something like that. Do, do you follow that? Does that make any sense? So first, like, I'm not sure that the Rick and Morty scenario is a skeptical scenario because all the things that they're perceiving are real. Okay. They just don't know what caused it all, but we don't know what caused our universe. And <laughs> so, so let's okay, substitute also, a matrix, the matrix scenario. Yeah. 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 Like, okay. You know, like the people who have this simulation hypothesis, they sometimes say, and you know, once the, people at the base level reality create a simulation, the simulated people can create simulations. And then the double simulated people can create simulations. So, I mean, if you're asking like, what would a skeptic say, you know, is there any reason for preferring the scenario that you're in the nth level simulation rather than the n minus one? Exactly. I assume they would say, no, there's no reason. Those are all equally good. Now, if you're asking me, I guess I would say, well, like the simplest hypothesis is that you're in the base level reality so like that's some reason for preferring that and like the more simulations you posit the more complex the hypothesis is so the less likely it is to be true i would think you want to just briefly review your perspective on this and your, your general perspective i mean I, I i take it to involve foundationalism direct realism and phenomenal conservatism and that kind of like the basic structure of your view on these issues I have two responses to the brain of that hypothesis that I think are pretty good, right? So one is the direct realist response. Direct realism in the theory of perception is a view that we can have foundational knowledge about certain external world facts. So when you have perceptual experiences, you get non-inferential justification for believing whatever it is that's the content of those experiences. I look at my hand and then I get non-inferential justification. Like I'm immediately justified in believing that there is something with the immediately visible characteristics, right? Why am I justified in believing that? Well, in general, you're justified in believing that things are the way they seem, unless you have a specific reason for doubting that, okay? And the way that it seems to me is that like I have two hands and I have a body and it doesn't seem to me like I'm a brain in a vat. I don't have any appearances of being a brain in a vat. Right? And, you know, importantly, in this epistemological view, it's the content of your experiences that's foundationally justified, right? That is, your experience represents that something is the case. And that proposition, the thing that's represented to be the case is what you have foundational justification for. What you have foundational justification for is not merely the proposition that you had a certain experience, but rather the proposition that is the content or that is represented by that experience to be the case. So I don't have any experiences that represent me to be a brain in a vat, but I do have experiences that represent me to have a normal body which is incompatible with being a brain of that. So it's rational for me to start from the assumption that I have a body and I'm not a brain in a vat, unless I get specific reasons for thinking that I would be a brain in a vat. There's one critique of skepticism. I'm curious what you think about this. It seems like Brian acknowledged it and kind of dismissed it, is to say that even alleged skeptics seem to go through life acting more or less like normal people with normal knowledge. So maybe there's something self-undermining about being a skeptic, or, or maybe there's like a performative contradiction or something like that in being a skeptic. So, you know, do even self-proclaimed skeptics actually believe and act as if they believe what they're saying? And I think he says that, you know, whether they do or not doesn't actually matter. And that, that seems plausible in some ways. But I, what, what do you think about that objection? Yeah, you might think this is an argument ad hominem or something like skeptics are hypocritical. So... Okay, their statements could still be true, <laughs> even though they're hypocritical. But, you know, I think it's not evidentially irrelevant. Like, if the people who are giving an argument can't themselves really believe the conclusion of their argument, I think that suggests that there's something wrong with the argument, right? Even the people who are most advocating it don't find it plausible, okay? But, you know, that is all assuming, as I do, that what it's rational to believe depends on what seems right to you, so... So, you know, skepticism seems so implausible that even the skeptics can't consistently act like they believe it. Is this true that skeptics don't really act like they believe it? I mean, if you're just a certainty skeptic, then you don't really have a problem explaining your behavior. Sometimes you ask, hey, you know, you ask the skeptic, 
you know, when you leave the room, how come you leave by the door and not by the window? <laughs> like, you know, don't you? <laughs> isn't that explained by, you know, your knowledge about how windows work and things like that? Right. And, you know, if you're just a certainty skeptic, you can say, well, it's highly probable that if I were to jump out the window, then I would experience some pain, which I don't like. So I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so you don't have to claim certainty. Right. But if you're a justification skeptic, it gets a lot harder to explain why you do anything. Well, you don't even have any justification for thinking that leaving through the door is better than leaving through the window. Then why do I keep seeing you leaving through the door? <laughs> right. So it seems like you must think you've got at least some justification, right? I mean, is anyone not a certainty skeptic in that way? Are there philosophers that are not skeptical of certainty of contingent external world facts? Yes, you probably won't like it. <laughs> so, you know, you know, like the people who are, what's the opposite of a skeptic? A dogmatist, the people who are certainty dogmatists. <laughs> Basically, you just have to dispute what certainty means. You know, like from the standpoint of the, quote, dogmatists, the skeptic is making the mistake of interpreting the word certainty way too strong. And just, and you have to look at the way that people use in ordinary life. And, you know, like, okay, you know, the police come to question you and they say, hey, you know, somebody's been killed in your building. Did you do it? <laughs> and you say, no, I didn't do it. And they say, are you sure? <laughs> okay. And now the correct answer to this is yes, I'm sure I did do it. The correct answer is not no, I'm not certain. I just think I probably didn't do it. <laughs> and anyway, so just live like in ordinary life, you get to say that you're sure or it's certain when it's not absolutely certain in the philosopher's sense, right? So maybe the philosopher's sense is sort of, it's not the ordinary English sense of the word, right? And then you could have arguments about whether knowledge implies certainty. Where, where do you and Brian end up agreeing? It seems like, you know, you know, you, you acknowledge in your opening essay and, you know, you've kind of said here, like maybe, you know, Brian is not one of the more extreme types of skeptics. He doesn't seem to be. You guys seem like have a pretty, pretty good amount of agreement. What Brian was really more known for was this work on controversy skepticism, just like the view that we don't know the answers to controversial questions, which you wrote a book about. It turned out that I didn't really disagree with that very much, right? Maybe there's a difference in that I'm a little more optimistic than he is, but I'm not a lot more optimistic, right? Like, I agree that people are very widely overconfident about controversial questions, especially like about their political opinions. There's a lot of overconfidence. If you're really sure that you know whether abortion is right or wrong, you know, you're being unreasonable. I think, I think that's unreasonable. I mean, there are a lot of experts who disagree about the issue, you know. Do you think that people are actually really sure about that when they're not, or that certain certain inflammatory issues cause people to talk as if they're more confident than they really are? Yeah, I think that is part of what's going on. Like part of what's going on in political discourse is that you have to signal your loyalty to your side. And, you know, you do that by taking strong positions. And sometimes you take a position that's stronger than you actually believe. And, you know, sometimes you haven't really thought it through, but you know what you're supposed to say. So you say the thing you're supposed to say. Yeah. And strong positions on difficult and controversial issues specifically. I mean, Scott Alexander's got an essay called The Toxoplasma of Rage. that's really good about that. And it's like you would not signal your loyalty to your side by opposing murder or opposing the Holocaust or something like that. Even if you could plausibly say that one side is a little bit more anti-murder than the other or something like that, that's not going to do a good job of signaling anything. You need to do something that really clearly demarcates like, this is my red team issue, or this is my blue team issue or whatever. And usually that's going to be issues that are much less certain and weaker. Yeah, yeah. Well, so like an example might be, um, you know, should abortion be legal? And then if you want to signal your blue tribe loyalty, you say, yeah, it should be legal throughout the pregnancy, you know, nine month fetus, you can still abort it as long as it's not all the way out. <laughs> and then if you want to signal your red team loyalty, you say, no, no, life begins at the moment of conception. We can't do stem cell research. And, you know, we can't do IVF because they kill the embryos before you know, the, the emb embryos that don't get implanted get killed, right? And these are like really, really small embryos, <laughs> okay? But, you know, if you say, no, you know, like I think it acquires rights, you know, 16 weeks, then you're not really 
showing your loyalty to your tribe, you know, then you're acting like a moderate, which means that you're willing to compromise with the other side, which means that you're not a reliable, <laughs> you know, supporter of us. Okay. And so if you're trying to win a general election, it could be good to be moderate. But if you're trying to like impress the people on your team, then, you know, you have to you have to go extreme. And that's actually like the normal trajectory of elections, right? In the primaries, you're more extreme to appeal to your primary voters in your base. And towards closer to the general election, you start to moderate because you're appealing to a wider audience. So, you know, like you asked, well, do people really hold the extreme views? Yeah, I think there are a bunch of people who really do hold extreme views. Like, they're not just saying. And not only that, but like they hold them with high confidence. Like they think that the other side is just completely stupid. You have, have people who are arguing about abortion who think like, I just can't understand how anybody could think that fetuses have rights. <laughs> right or vice versa i can't see how anyone could deny that fetuses are people and you know it's like i don't know it appears that that's the way they feel like yeah by the way what's your essay on that called you you have a really good essay just just basically about how abortion really is a difficult issue yeah i think it's called abortion is difficult <laughs> that sounds right <laughs> this, is, this is on fake news yes right yeah which, Mike, which mike's uh, sub stack everybody should go check it out but so you know like if there's an issue that a lot of smart people are disagreeing about and have been disagreeing about for a while, it's probably not blindingly obvious. I'm not saying that couldn't be. Like, there could be a time when a lot of smart people are just acting stupid. And it's like, there could be, a, that could happen. But most of the time, that's not happening, right? So if you regularly think that the other side on controversial issues is stupid, even though there's like, obviously high IQ people on the other side, if you regularly think that they're stupid, you're probably biased, right? It's probably not that all those people are really stupid. So can you flesh out then? I mean, it sounds like Brian's type of skepticism is controversy skepticism. And it has something to do with, you know, being more skeptical of controversial issues or issues where experts disagree with you. I mean, maybe there's not a controversial issue, but maybe you're just on the, the wrong side of an expert consensus. Does that fall under what he's talking about with controversy skepticism? The issue was kind of controversial, although there is a consensus among the experts. So like evolution, like virtually all biologists agree with evolution, but it's controversial, not in biology, but it's controversial in the wider society because there are creationists who don't believe the theory of evolution. Or you have the global warming issue where, let's say, it's a lot more controversial in the wider society than it is among the climate scientists. But, you know, like maybe you're thinking of a case where, no, no, like it's not controversial. You're just like a weirdo. <laughs> like, <laughs> so like, you know, both ordinary people and experts tend to agree with this theory, but you happen to not disagree with it. So I assume that the controversy skeptic would say you're in, in an even worse position there than, yeah, than in the case where it's controversial. What is Brian's view around what does he think are like the epistemic requirements for agreement, for expert agreement? or for controversy before you can legitimately have knowledge about some subject? Oh, I don't know. So you like, this is why you should get him on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> his view. It looked to me like the view was, well, as long as the issue is controversial, you shouldn't have a confident opinion about it. You have to wait for there to be an expert consensus. You might think, oh, no, like I can examine the arguments and I could just see that the experts have gone wrong in some case. Like there are a bunch of people who appear to think this, right? Like, so when you meet people who don't agree with man-made global warming, they will often say, well, like they've done their own research. And so, and then they figured out that the experts were wrong. I take it that the controversy skeptic would say, no, like even though you did a lot of research, you're probably wrong because the experts probably also know that research. And they probably know why it's wrong. And like, they're not convinced by it, probably, right? Or sure, you know, it's likely, it's likely that it's because they're wrong. You have a decent amount of agreement to this. Maybe this is a semantic question, but do you think that this, that controversy skepticism really even amounts to skepticism? I mean, it's not skepticism in the way that I defined in my earlier book, in skepticism and the veil of perception. But, you know, like, I don't want to be the semantic police so that you can sure. call it skepticism. Right? And, and it's common for people to use skepticism to just mean, like, doubt about some particular thing that's of interest. I guess that I might be a little more optimistic than Brian is. So because, like, I have a lot of controversial views, and I think it's okay for me to keep holding them. So what are the limits of, of controversy skepticism? When are you justified in disagreeing with experts and why? Or having a strong belief 
when there is either, you know, significant, if not consensus, a significant amount of experts against you, or when there's just been controversy? I mean, there's a few things like, well, sometimes you have reason to think the experts are biased. Like a simple case would be, you know, a lot of academics think that there should be more government funding for academics. <laughs> like a lot of professors think the government should provide free college education, which would, of course, create more job opportunities and probably raise the pay of us. So <laughs> I've reason to think that we would be biased on that question. So if I disagree with the consensus of the experts, I shouldn't be so worried about that, right? They could be biased in less obvious, less self-interested ways. They could have a sort of emotional disposition that tends to go with certain political beliefs. The other thing that I worry about more, um, especially recently, is sort of like our institutional practices or like our practices for pursuing truth are sort of corrupted, where like people don't speak freely. The ability of all of the people engaged in the discussion to speak freely is part of why you should trust the consensus. And so if that's not happening, then you shouldn't trust the consensus, right? So I think about things like, you know, like people not being allowed to question the, the efficacy of mask wearing during COVID-19 or the efficacy of lockdowns, right? Or not being allowed to talk about whether the, the virus came from a lab leak or something, right? Because like you'd be, your post would be taken down from social media or something like that, right? So like if that's happening, then you can't trust the expert consensus, right? You can only trust the consensus if it was formed by people really freely exchanging ideas and like everybody being able to give whatever arguments they wanted. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there's any number of examples of societies where that's clearly not happening. You're talking about some issues in contemporary Western society, which is otherwise has a better than average track record for, you know, liberalism and communication and, and speech and stuff and freedom of experts to talk about these kinds of things. But plenty of people might just not have access to a good expert consensus or any, or, or just might not have access to knowing what smart people think about any given issue because it's quite suppressed. I don't know what it's like to live in Saudi Arabia or something, but I, I'm positive that if you live in North Korea, you're just not going to have access to a ton of examples of what smart people, of what the bulk of smart people actually think about issues. You know, like people should update their beliefs on the fact that they weren't given all of the evidence but they generally don't. So censorship frequently works. It works in countries like North Korea or the former Soviet Union because the government has total control. So like the North Korean government can shut down any media source that doesn't agree with them. And then I think that does actually work. It causes people to have views that are much more favorable to the government, but they shouldn't, right? They should, like knowing that the government is controlling the information, they should the inference that the information that's out there that they're suppressing is substantially showing that the government is bad, right? When somebody tries to shut down your access to information, you should infer that that's because they know that the information would cause you to believe the opposite of what they're telling you. And then just knowing that there's some information that would cause you to believe that should cause you, in fact, to believe that. And that kind of thing happens, you know, on a really large scale in significantly more restrictive societies. But, you know, it happens in freer Western societies as well, but in probably more limited cases. So I don't know a good example. I'm, I'm sure like in, you you know, we know that in foreign policy, a lot of information is classified and is and is collected specifically by the organs of government that are carrying out foreign policy. So maybe that's a reason to be skeptical of the information that we get there. You know, yeah. how do we know we have WMDs because the people who are wanting to go to war in Iraq said we do and we should take their word for it or something? It's not even necessarily that the experts believe the thing. <laughs> it's that they're telling you the thing. Right. Because, like, you know, with the with the intelligence community and the government, you always have to wonder if they're lying. Maybe they know the truth. <laughs> they're just lying to you. Yeah. Right. right. Now, in the case of the George W. Bush, WMD, whatever, fiasco, I don't think they were exactly lying, but I don't think they were completely honest either. Like, I think what they were doing was they were exaggerating the strength of the evidence. They had some evidence that Saddam Hussein was collecting WMDs. Right. Although I noticed that they never said exactly what the WMDs were. Okay, are they nuclear bombs? Are they chemical weapons? We know he had chemical weapons, so what? But anyway, okay, but anyway, 
Okay, so they had some evidence for this, but it wasn't conclusive, but they represented it as being nearly conclusive or something like that. And it just wasn't as strong. So anyway, okay. But so, you know, you got to worry about that when there are political motives for a person to want to say a particular thing, right? And then that could be a good reason for you to not trust them and maybe disagree with what the alleged experts are saying. What are some other reasons that you're more optimistic about this issue than Brian is? So there's a question about whether people are being overconfident. And I think people are often overconfident, but maybe not as much as it appears. <laughs> because often the thing that they're saying in political discourse, they don't really mean it, right? Or they're not really as confident as they project themselves to be because of the thing we were saying earlier that, you know, they're just trying to signal to their tribe. Okay, so, they're, so they don't have as much irrational belief, right? They more believe falsification. Sometimes the people who are disagreeing with me, I think they actually don't know the arguments, right? So like I have extreme libertarian views and most academics disagree with libertarianism, but I think they frequently actually don't know what the libertarian arguments are. And so like, it's not that, it's not so unreasonable for me to think that they're wrong in their assessment when they don't in fact know the arguments. And the reason why they wouldn't know the arguments is they don't have to, right? Because in the, in the academic world, there's just like so much dominance of leftism that if you're writing an article from a left-wing perspective, you do not have to take account of the libertarian view. But if you're writing an article from the libertarian perspective, you do have to take into account the left-wing view. Everybody has to take into account the left-wing views, right? But the left-wing people don't have to take into account the right-wing views. And so they may, in fact, not even know. But so the fact that they don't know means that it's rational for me to discount their low opinion of the right-wing views. I assume that they have to take into account at least somewhat more ordinary right-wing views, which which are maybe, you know, not dominant in academia, but are at least prominent in politics and, and other things. So they know libertarian views to the small extent that they sometimes overlap with right-wing views. So they know kind of impoverished, weird versions of some libertarian yeah. views and arguments. Well, I mean, I'm not sure that they even have to take into account mainstream conservative views. I mean, like, you know, I'm not... I'm not actually sure whether conservatism or libertarianism is more prominent in academia, right? <laughs> Which is a little bit weird because libertarians are a tiny portion of the wider society compared to conservatives. And conservatives are, you know, maybe half of the society or something like this. But nevertheless, it may be that libertarians are a bigger voice in academia. I, I've, I've read that. There's an outsized influence in the intelligentsia because, I don't know, there's so many of them are like, prominent academic economist. Yeah. You just can't shut us up, you know. We're just, <laughs> we're just constantly blabbering about our views. So, Hey, everyone. This is Chris Kaufman. Just want to take a quick break to tell you all I appreciate you so much for listening to the show. And it's still a new show, still a growing show. And if you want to help me out, I would greatly appreciate it. Simplest thing you could do is recommend it to a friend and give it a rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Their algorithms rank the shows higher, make it more visible, make it more searchable if it has more star ratings, more reviews. So anything like that would be very, very helpful. Thank you so much. I appreciate you all. Back to the show. Uh, one issue with controversy skepticism that occurs to me is it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's always just a trivial or obvious thing to figure out who the relevant experts are on any given issue and what they actually think. I mean, when you say it like, you know, or is there expert disagreement? What do the experts think about this? I mean, I don't think it's impossible to figure it out. And sometimes sometimes it's easy. But I think that's a far from trivial thing. Like you, <laughs> someone's got to have expertise on figuring out who the experts are. It's like a little bit of a, of a regression problem of and sometimes there are prominent people with I don't know. It seems like science journalism is notoriously bad at accurately reflecting what scientists think. And there's like there's this problem of like people do initial research and somebody collects the research and somebody reports, you know, on the research and and that yeah, yeah. gets put into like a little snippet in a headline or something like that. So do people actually know what experts really think about some things? So I'm under the impression that, you know, so science journalism is frequently unreliable. I think scientists, when they read the journalistic account of a scientific theory, they frequently have the reaction that, like, no, that's not what I said. And, you know, that the journalist greatly misunderstood it. 
Right. But also like, I think the science, the science journalists, they could be taken over by activists. Like they could be convinced to report something because an activist said it. So, so a good example of this is in the global warming issue. A bunch of people have gotten under the impression that global warming is an existential threat, that there's a good chance that it's going to destroy our civilization if we don't stop it by 2030. Okay, so so like AOC said, we had whatever, 12 years left before the world would end. And Greta Thunberg also said this. And okay, and so and now there's a bunch of people and like, you know, in my classes, there's a bunch of undergraduates who think that we're literally all going to die, right? Because the average temperature is going to go up by a couple of degrees. And that's just going to kill every all life on it or something like, okay, and like that is all based on a total misunderstanding. Right. So like the IPCC did a report on what we would have to do to keep global warming under two degrees C relative to pre-industrial times. And they said in order to do that, we would have to drastically reduce CO2 emissions by 2030. They never said that civilization was going to collapse if we didn't do it. Right. And they never say anything crazy like that. The IPCC is not a bunch of you know, like crazy people. <laughs> Okay, but there's a bunch of activists who are just like coming up with these misinterpretations, you know, based on probably not reading. Okay, you know, the, uh, another another famous thing is like you you might have heard famously that 97% of climate scientists agree with anthropogenic climate change. Yeah, I know um, about this controversy, but yeah, go on. Yeah, so like you know, there's just an illustration of the fact that sometimes it's hard to know what the experts even think. Okay, so like that's not true. Okay, it's, it's not 97%, All right? What happened was somebody looked up a bunch of abstracts of articles in climate science, and then, um, and most of them didn't take any position on whether there's man-made global warming. But what they did was, so they just ignored all of those, and they only looked at the ones where the abstract seemed to imply or state a position on anthropogenic climate change. And then of those, 97% were positive. Okay. But not even actually, not, like yeah. that that it played some role in it or something like that. It posit yeah, yeah. a consensus on a fairly moderate position. Yeah, that that yeah, like you know whatever. There's some significant role for human human caused climate change, and then that sometimes gets misreported as they thought that human beings are the main cause, right? <laughs> Which wasn't what the original study said, right? But so okay, but actually there have been surveys. So like you know, looking at abstracts of published articles is not necessarily a good way of finding out even what climate scientists believe, because there are a bunch of climate scientists who didn't publish on that topic. Let alone what all scientists believe, right? Because sometimes it's misquoted as ninety-seven percent of scientists. Yeah. Okay, but actually, there have been surveys. Okay, so there was a survey of the American Meteorological Society on what they thought about anthropogenic climate change. And there, the agreement was about 50%, right? Like about 50% of people were confident that human beings had a significant role in climate change. By the way, the other ones were not denying it. They were more like unsure, okay? Yeah. And then, you know, if you, okay, so and to be clear, that's still pretty good reason for thinking that anthropogenic climate change is real, okay? <laughs> But like the number of people who agree with it is much larger than the, than the number who disagreed with it, right? But you know, I'm simply saying it's not it's not close to 97 percent. Okay, <laughs> so like the 97 percent is a thing that activists like to you know go around and repeat. But if you hear some fact or factoid that seems like really persuasive for a particular controversial political view, it is probably false or radically misleading. And by radically misleading, I mean, if you knew the full context, you would probably draw the opposite conclusion or like a completely different conclusion from the one that the factoid is leading you to draw. Are there other prominent examples you can think of? Um, there's a popular view about what the expert consensus is. And then that popular view is just exaggerated relative to the actual situation, right? But also there's like, you know, you have to take into account what the experts are experts on. So Climate scientists are experts on the climate, but they're not experts on human society. So it's reasonable to think they're probably right about the climate, but that doesn't mean that they can make claims about what the impacts on society or what society should do and how we should prioritize different global problems and such. Anyway, so like, I don't know of issues that are quite like that. I mean, another issue though, where I think 
it's difficult to figure out what the expert consensus is, is like the whole transgender issue. It's hard to figure out what most experts think about that because people can't speak freely about it because of fear of trans activists. If anybody questions whether trans women are really women, then that person has to, they have to be afraid that trans activists are going to try to cancel them. And that's true even if they are scientists. And so that means that like we can't trust what scientists or psychologists say about this issue, right? Like that the activists have made it so that we can't trust the science or we don't know what the science is. Potentially filtered out to where the the main people who are going to be questioning it are going to be the more strident, maybe less not always less thoughtful. A lot of a lot of very thoughtful people have had the guts to disagree, whether I agree with them or not. I think Kathleen Stock's book is really good. You don't even know what the best arguments are on either side. Okay, so you don't know what the arguments are against whatever trans women being genuine women, because well-established scientists are not going to put their career on the line by touching this issue. So the people who are going to touch it are going to be people who are like political activist types. Right? People who are very used to courting controversy and being in a public maelstrom. Yeah. yeah, which is usually not like top scientists. So like like Matt Walsh, right? Yes. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> well, like he's probably not the best exponent of that view. Like, you know, he probably doesn't give the most sophisticated presentation, but he's the one that you're going to hear because he's the one who doesn't give a shit if people are attacking him. <laughs> So, yeah. So, OK, so it seems fair to say that some some of the maybe pitfalls of controversy skepticism are identifying who the relevant experts are in the first place, worrying about whether or not you're in a sufficiently open environment for for debating the issue, either from state censorship or from a cultural atmosphere of extreme hostility and tension around the issue. You know, anyone can see this in a just in a family dinner, like, are there issues, for better or worse, that you feel more or less comfortable talking freely about in front of mixed company? And everyone has this experience. I assume Brian would say, yeah, you know, these things are all just like more support for being skeptical. <laughs> right? He's like, right, because like, he's not taking a particular position. He's saying we don't know. Right? And like, yeah, if you have a hard time identifying the experts, then that just makes it harder. So like I had a brief exchange with David Friedman, right? He posted something on his blog about how, you know, humor is too trusting of experts or, or something. You know, I basically thought, well, it's okay to do your own research if you're David Friedman you know, or, <laughs> or if you're Mike Humor, okay? You know, the average person out there should not be doing their own research. Like they should not, they should not be trying to figure this stuff out on their own because they're going to mess it up. You and David are both professional academics who do research for a living, among other things. So uh, yeah. this is the idea of doing your own research means something different for a professional researcher. David Friedman and I are smarter and more educated and more rational than most people. And so, so like I feel like his advice, you know, just go and figure stuff out, you know, using your own brain, and like you know, you can question the experts and all that is good advice if you're, you know, somebody like David Friedman. <laughs> but it's but it's not good advice if you're a more ordinary person, you know, because you're you're gonna mess it up. And like if you disagree with the experts because you think that you figured out the fallacies and their arguments, what usually happens is that no, you're committing fallacies and you're just not noticing it. Now I have to bring up something he mentioned in in my interview with him, because we talked about ethical intuitionism and you and his fairly shared ethical worldview. And he said he thought the biggest disagreement that you guys had is that you were more confident of your shared view than he was. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> do you have any reaction to that? Sounds true. I mean, <laughs> yeah, David David Friedman is often a little bit milk toast, right? <laughs> and I feel confident of moral realism, but it's hard for me to convey this confidence to other people. <laughs> you know, it's like... It's hard hard to get other people to see that. But to me, the main alternative to believing in moral reality is believing that nothing matters. And to me, the idea that nothing matters is ridiculous. Like there's there are many examples of things that matter. It's just like very obvious. And you know, like the idea that it doesn't matter if you torture babies and just like throw them in a fire, that, that that's just as good as anything else you could do. You know, to me, like that's insane in the way that like believing that you live in the matrix is insane. Right? 
It's like, you know, it's, it's that kind of denial of the obvious. What did he say? He said, basically, he agreed that that's the main alternative, that the main alternative is that, well, you know, whatever moral evaluative ideas you have are mostly just ways that your evolutionary psychology has fooled you to you know, do a variety of things to, that evolution cares, you know, that evolution has caused you to do and has fooled you into having some highfalutin evaluative notions in your head. But that he feels that he is just simply not capable of actually believing that, even though he doesn't think he has particularly good arguments to show that it's not true. Yeah. But that so, you do. I mean, you know, I think I think there are particular cases where it's plausible that somebody's value judgments are biases that have an evolutionary psychology explanation. This is especially happens with people's views about productive ethics, so to speak. So take the view, the commonly held view, I think, that sexual promiscuity is bad for a woman, but good for a man. Females who have many partners are known as sluts, which is bad. And males who have many partners are known as studs, which is good. What's the explanation of that? That's weird. <laughs> when you try to think about it purely rationally, it seems pretty weird. But there's an evolutionary explanation for this, right, which has to do with, you know, parental investment. And it's much more risky for a female to have partners that, that are not committed to her because then she winds up pregnant. And the male doesn't wind up pregnant. So the male has zero cost to sexual intercourse, right? you know, approximately zero cost. So, okay, so there's like an evolutionary explanation. So that value judgment is probably wrong, it seems weird on its face, and you can come up with an explanation for why people would have this sort of corresponding emotions that could lead them to make those judgments, even if it wasn't true. So it's probably not true. <laughs> okay, but the idea that you could similarly debunk every value judgment, I think, is totally implausible. You might have specific stories that cast doubt on certain value judgments, like the one you just gave, but it's nothing like a general takedown argument. Of a value yeah. of claims. Yeah. Many people have value judgments that conflict with what you would expect from evolution. Right. And in fact, people have frequently revised their judgments away from like what evolution presumably programmed us to believe. And so when that happens, it's hard to try to debunk that. Right. All right. So, like, you know, belief, belief in the equality of all people. That was not the received view throughout human history. Right, throughout human history, there was a lot of bias towards your own tribe and you know, towards people who are similar to yourself. And then we gradually developed the idea that, well, that's wrong, that you know, everybody's equally important regardless of what group they belong to. So you can debunk the earlier belief, but then you can't thereby debunk the later belief, right? Like the earlier belief had an evolutionary explanation, but then the later belief in which we rejected that does not. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you have any good recommendations? I want to plug your books that are also on this topic. I have not read Skepticism in the Veil of Perception, but I assume it, it bears on this book. And you've also got your epistemology textbook. Yeah. Look, everybody should buy this book. Understanding, Understanding Knowledge, which also I don't remember the number, but we discussed on a different episode. And, and it's a great book. Any, any other of your own books that bear on this before you recommend someone else's book? Yeah, you know, I'm trying to remember the name of Brian Francis's book. I think maybe it's Skepticism Comes Alive or something like that. That sounds familiar. Anyway, you know, Brian is very interesting and, you know, smart, reasonable thinker. Okay, awesome. So in addition to in addition to Mike's other books on this topic, Brian's book Skepticism Comes Alive. And do you have any new projects upcoming that you want to plug? You know, I'm working on a book about progressive political myths, right, which is why I know this stuff about the global warming and the transgenderism, right? And so, you know, I'm, I'm just going to, and by progressive political myths, I mean factual beliefs that are widely held by progressives that seem to really strongly support progressive ideology and that are objectively factually wrong. There are a lot of these. <laughs> so no, I just feel like they should be exposed. Exposed in catalog somewhere. Are you going to do a, a conservative myths book? No, and uh, or I wasn't planning on it. And I feel like there aren't as many. And I feel like the the left is better at coming up with these myths. But so they're they're better at propaganda, so to speak. Is they're better at coming up with um, statistics or other like empirical factual claims 
that sound like scientific truths or just like, you know, sound like objective facts and sound like they super strongly support their ideology. They're better at that than the conservatives are. And when the conservatives say false stuff, it doesn't it doesn't sound like scientific truths. I was going to say, like, what do you? Oh, is this like the idea? The that election was stolen. You know, Joe Biden stole the election, <laughs> I and mean, that that doesn't sound like, you know, an objective fact, or it doesn't sound like that's empirical evidence that should convince you. Is this the idea that like the the right is more likely to just when they're saying misleading things, it's more likely to be more closer to a blatant lie and something silly that, that the more typically right wing media is more outrageously yeah. and obviously false and left-wing media is more likely to be false in a more sophisticated way. Yeah. I mean, I was trying to think of what the difference is, like the claim that the election was stolen. It's not persuasive on its face. Like it's a thing that if you are already a right-wing Trump supporter, you might believe, but it doesn't seem like the th sort of thing that would persuade someone because it doesn't even claim to be evidence. They're not claiming to give you the objective piece of evidence that would convince you of the conclusion. They're just giving you the conclusion. And, you know, so like the, the left wing people, they want you to conclude that America is a patriarchy. They don't just say America is a patriarchy. They will say something like, you know, women earn 80 cents for every dollar that men earn for the same work or something like that. And so that sounds like an empirical fact and not just like an ideological conclusion. And so then you could understand somebody hearing that and thinking, well, I have to accept that because that's the empirical fact. And so then now I have to start inferring the things that the progressive want, wants me to infer. All right. In the case of you know the conservatives, like another myth would be that immigrants are especially crime prone. Like I think that's a conservative myth. I think they're less crime prone than the general population. Okay, but the conservatives wouldn't. I haven't heard this. I haven't heard them actually try to give a statistic. That would be a false or misleading statistic. Just news headlines? Yeah. Like they would give an anecdote and the anecdote would be true. <laughs> like they would, they would give an example of an immigrant who committed a crime. And then, but like, you know, what you would do if you were a left wing person is you would say like, you know, immigrants commit 50% more crime or, you know, since you're being left wing, immigrants commit 50% less crime than native or whatever. So there would be something that sounds like that came out of a scientific study. Right. right? And so... It seems like the progressive propaganda is more in need of debunking, I feel. When do you think that book's going to be done? Maybe in the summer. Awesome. And where can people find you if they want to keep up with your work? Uh, so, you know, they should look at my Substack, which is fake news, F A K E N O U S dot Substack dot com. I also have a website, which is O W L 232 dot net. And also, I have some books on Amazon. So. Awesome. My guest today has been Mike Humor, and his book, once again, co-authored with Brian Francis, is Can We Know Anything? A Debate. Mike, thanks for joining me again on Ideas Having Sex. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Ideas Having Sex, where we have stimulating conversations on social science, philosophy, history, politics, and more. If you're a fan of what I do, please take a minute to subscribe to the show and to give us a rating and review wherever you listen. I'm Chris Kaufman. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.